There's a community that is fully furious with you and a smaller community that believes in you. Why did you decide one day to wake up and piss off everybody? Well, I didn't really decide that at all. If you are Satoshi Nakamoto, you're essentially worth $8.8 .8 billion. It matters not how much money you have. You make something by building, creating, investing. I want you to use Bitcoin. I don't want you to hoard it. But why were you not public from day one? Cash is disappearing. That's a bad thing. So if I wanted to go into Apple, Walmart, Amazon, I can't make any of the purchase with Bitcoin today. No, and that's a problem. Why don't you sell all your Bitcoin? If you try and move $100 million, the value of Bitcoin is going to go right down. Let's just say somebody really pissed you off. Can you bring down the whole concept of Bitcoin if you wanted to? What is the concept of Bitcoin? Buy this, you'll be rich. They're allowing child pornography. They're allowing money launderers. Bitcoin was never designed to be any of those things. Do you regret creating Bitcoin? I was building a working version of electronic cash. Everyone you'll be able to scam is right here in Bitcoin. Look what I've done. I've helped by clicking like. You haven't. And all these people who think they have, you're scum. And if you don't like that, get off your freaking ass and do something about it. My guest today is Craig Wright who claims to be Satoshi Nakamoto, which some of you agree with, some of you don't. And uh, he's done a lot of things in his career, a lot of interesting things in his career. And after the recent interview with Max Kaiser, our guy, Alan, reached out and said, maybe we ought to have Craig Wright as a guest. And he agreed. So Craig, thank you so much for being a guest on Value Entertainment. You're welcome. So how much, how much, you know, I call people, I'm not in the Bitcoin world. Obviously I've owned Bitcoin, I have a small percentage of Bitcoin, but I'm not one that follows all the forums. I'm not one that's, you know, because uh, the community is an interesting community of a lot of uh, true believers. There's a community that is fully furious with you and a smaller community that believes in you. Why did you decide one day to wake up and piss off everybody? Well, I didn't really decide that at all. I mean, where people are going wrong is that they seem to think that um, uh, I'm going to invent a creation and then be happy that everyone twists and makes it into something else. Shortly after I left uh, sort of my uh, pseudonym uh, with the sort of launch of uh, uh, drug markets and whatever else that I didn't really want. We had uh, people like the Electronic Frontier Foundation come out with these comments about Bitcoin, this new censorship resistant system, talking about how it will stop governments taking your money and all this stuff. Bitcoin doesn't do anything like that. That is all mythology. So these people hate me for the simple fact that I'm ruining their myth. It's basically the case of they've produced a church of Satoshi and I've come back and I'm not what they want. It's the scene in, in um, Dostoevsky where the Christ uh, comes back to actually talk with the Inquisitor and the Inquisitor doesn't want him. He sits there saying, we don't need you anymore. The church is fine. But the church is not fine. And these people, that what they're wanting to do is not fine. Bitcoin's designed to be a system that is open and honest. You can't do that by destroying governments. People forget that government is just a word. What government is at the end of the day, whether it's good or bad, it's people. So if we have a good government, it's because we have a system that is managed and controlled by people that care about it. And if we have a bad government, it's because people allow them to have that. Okay, so for the average person, you just went to a crazy different place, to the, 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 you, you went to a very deep place. But for the, for the average, let, let me just put some things uh, out there numbers wise. Hmm. If you are Satoshi Nakamoto, if you are Satoshi Nakamoto, if you are, and, and when I say if you are, you're saying you know you are, I'm just saying for the skeptics, if you are Satoshi Nakamoto, you're essentially worth, on paper, $8.8 .8 billion. Is that pretty accurate? Uh, I don't actually know. I know it's a lot of money. I don't sit there watching the price. Um, yes, it's a lot of money. So that's, that's a lot of money, $8.8 .8 And I know at the peak of it, when Bitcoin hit $20,000, it was around $20 billion. 
Oh, the reality yeah. there, though, is you can't actually sell any of these things for that amount. So if people say you've got that much money, but you don't really, because if you try and sell it, then it goes down a lot. So the actual realizable value is a lot less than that. Uh, but the reality here is it matters not about how much money you have. It, it matters what you, can, what you can do, what you can actually live in your life. And I have enough money to go through university myself still, uh, to pay for my, my kids to go through university, to have them educated properly, to travel, to spend time with my family, uh, to do things I want. And what more is really important? I mean, past that, who cares? Yeah, I know. But, but the, the thing is, like, you know, if you look at Ethereum founder, Vitaly, he's a pretty public guy. It's not like he is <laughs> hidden. You know, this is why I'm, I'm the founder and he does whatever he can to not be that much of a guy that's the control because the whole thing about uh, uh, crypto is the fact that it's the complete opposite of banking. So it's no one figure you look at. It's not a hierarchy type of a model. But that's actually wrong. So this is, this is part of what they don't like. There are no sort of, oh, we're, we're out of this. Vitalik is the leader. He is the issuer of Ethereum. When he decided that the DAO didn't work, he changed it. It wasn't a community or a group. None of this is about distributed groups do it. That's a lie that's propagated and promoted so that these few people in charge can say, don't look at me. Don't take me to be responsible. I didn't do that. That's the whole point. It is these people who are shirking their responsibility, who are basically allowing all sorts of heinous things to, do, uh, to be just rife. And the truth of the matter is they're making money out of that. They're allowing child porn. They're allowing um, drug sales, hard drugs. And they're sitting there going, it's not my fault. The community wants it. The community doesn't vote on this. The consensus mechanism in Bitcoin is the creation of blocks. At present, in BTC, Sea world even, there are only 32 nodes. Of that, three or four control the whole system. Now, the developer bit, they sit there going, the community does this. The community don't do anything. Three people control the GitHub keys. In Ethereum, two people basically do it. I mean, your average company like General Motors has more decentralization than any cryptocurrency that people are talking about. This, this whole nature of it's about decentralization was never about Bitcoin. It's people who piled in after I left the scene in 2011, who've taken up this concept and, and run around going, Bitcoin's broken, we have to fix it. Bitcoin was never designed to be any of those things. Bitcoin was, okay, so when you were saying that, you were saying Vitalik, uh, he's saying, I'm just trying to get people to do what they want to do. I'm not like the bank leader. I'm not the hierarchy leader. You're saying the complete opposite. So what does that make you if you're saying you are Satoshi Nakamoto? I'm saying exactly the same things I said online. I would never said that this was a decentralized system or that it's good for drug sales or any of these things. I actually said, don't invite WikiLeaks. And yet that's the opposite of what everyone did. I didn't run around going, it's an anti-banking system. There's no quotes you'll find from me at any point saying those things. I didn't say it replaces banking. It, that's really ignorant when you think about it. Banking is not cash. Bitcoin is an electronic cash system. Now, banking, on the other hand, is distribution of capital. Bitcoin doesn't take your funds and pool them and give out home loans. It doesn't give out business loans. It doesn't manage those, uh, those sources of funds. It's cash. And this is, these people are too ignorant to even realize, or if they're not ignorant, they're disingenuous. And they're sitting there saying that we're going to replace banking for third world people. It's not. Third world people don't have investment. They don't have loans. Saying you've got Bitcoin isn't going to pull those people out of poverty. What it does is it allows this false narrative of a Ponzi where people sit there going, it's going to keep going up forever. Invest now because I've already invested and I want more money. 
That's the problem here. So, so what are these people are building? So do, do you feel, it sounds like you're, you're, you don't sound optimistic, you sound pessimistic. So let's just say you are the founder of Bitcoin and you're the monkey or Satoshi Nakamoto. If you are, do you regret uh, creating Bitcoin? No, I regret not managing things properly. Um, I notice you've got a, a cross around your neck and um, um, I used to be a pastor and I've uh, actually started young. Roman Catholic and um, moved over to be Protestant because uh, yeah. it fit me better uh, and I like actually being married. Um, but there's a concept of stewardship. So the whole Catholic ideal of stewardship is important. Whether you're Protestant or Catholic or whatever else, this idea of having long-term investment, ownership, and managing everything, knowing your problems, being responsible. This is what really built Western culture, responsibility, knowing that you are the center of your own problems and causes. And what I regret is when I left, when I, I sort of left everything happen the way it was, I thought I could work in the background and, and fix things without being involved. But I abdicated, not sort of delegated. There's a big difference. And part of stewardship is taking ownership of what you, you cause, your problems and everything like that. And that's what I regret. I regret not doing that, not sort of, it was a, a harder choice and I should have made it back then. So what, if you're saying uh, um, Vitalik is public and he's the leader of Ethereum, but why were you not public from day one? I thought things would sort themselves out. I didn't, I mean, there was a church of Satoshi for a while. There was a whole lot of other things. I mean, I did not foresee any of this. Um, the whole idea of Bitcoin and the protocol is that it doesn't change. None of this, we get to keep doing soft forks or hard forks or anything. The whole concept of set in stone is we have a protocol that grows and Miners don't vote, as everyone says. Miners uh, don't choose what the protocol is. Think about that for a moment. That is a horrible scenario. That is might makes right. Those with the most money, the most power, get to choose what happens in our monetary system. That's not democratic. That's not fair. Do you really want to see some large Russian company or r large Chinese company dictating world financial policy. That's what these people are arguing, that criminals can dictate financial policy that can't be changed even by government or law enforcement. Really, think about that for a moment. We get two large miners, each with 30%, and they have joint control as an oligarchy, and they can dictate to the rest of the world that child pornography is good. Uh, Mr. Antonopoulos, writer of um, Mastering Shitcoin, uh, came up with this, oh, well, it's not my place to tell people um, that child porn's bad. I mean, if people want to do that, they should make their own decisions. Wrong. I don't care about this um, Foucaultian postmodern ideal. I still believe that we have sort of an overarching idea of morality. This pluralist system, Hegelian, uh, horrible world of everyone having a right to whatever they believe, no matter how low and, and despicable it is, is wrong. I don't really care. There is a morality that is native to humanity and doing the wrong things will never be acceptable. And allowing a small cadre of potentially criminals who are money launderers and want to take money and do all these things that I've already mentioned and get away with it because they have more hash power. That is asinine. So who, what, what kind of people has Bitcoin attracted? You've mentioned child porn now twice, uh, uh, drug traffic. What kind of people have been turned on by Bitcoin because they can go uh, and not, they can break the law and not be found. What, what, what kind of community has that attracted? In around June, July 2010, 
there was the first inkling of this, which I, I didn't take too seriously at the time. The first version of what became Silk Road was launched um, initially selling uh, things like magic mushrooms and, and whatever else. And then it broke out into straight into heroin. I mean, it's one thing if you want to try and allow people to sell um, pot, especially where it's legal, uh, but they can't get banking. It's another to start saying that, well, heroin's okay too. It's personal choice. It's not. It's incredibly addictive and destructive. The same with meth and ice and all these other things. And a lot of people came as e-gold collapsed. E-gold was taken down around the start of Bitcoin. And then at the end of that period, Liberty Reserve with Liberty Reserve Euro and Liberty Reserve Dollar was also taken down. And all of those people flocked into Bitcoin because the Electronic Frontier Foundation, WikiLeaks, other people were sitting there going, Bitcoin's this system that you can't track, can't trace, that allows you to do anything. We've now seen some of the largest child pornography rings in the world taken down because people have tracked Bitcoin transactions in and out of them. Um, there are only uh, just recently a couple of those, one in Korea just a little while ago. There have been many drug sites taken down, but the whole thing here is Bitcoin isn't encrypted. It's not really a cryptocurrency. There's no encryption at all in Bitcoin. It's an open ledger. The identity function is firewalled. So if you can imagine this, the way it's written is like having an index. That index links the individual who owns the tokens, but simultaneously, it allows other people not to see who that is. So the way to think about this is pseudonymy means that you can externally link information without actually making it all public. So it doesn't mean you don't have identity. In fact, digital signatures require identity. The definition of a signature means that you can't be anonymous. So all these people saying there's digital signatures in Bitcoin only if you have identity. If it's anonymous, it's not a signature. So, if we take that a little bit further, we start thinking about the fact that we have this record and it's designed to be something like an old bugger like me would understand. I've worked in accounting firms and in the past, we used to have paper-backed um, sort of records, ledgers, journals, and they're really difficult to change. They're expensive to try and change. So if you have all that, you can't just uh, scribble out an entry and add it because everything needs to sort of follow and be correct, write down a double entry journal. So you can't go somewhere in the past and scribble out a line, but you can fix it because it is visible, because everyone can read it. Think about this. You have all these immutable journals in the past, but people made mistakes. So they still have errata sheets. They still have linked journals where they can change things. None of this having to go back and recalculate all the hashes or any of this stuff. All you need to do is have the miners say, this is what the new entry is. And they can do that following a court order or whatever else. The purpose of nodes is not to have this decentralized finance idea which actually goes right back to the uh, 1920s. The, the original um, sort of concept of uh, having promotion of shares and plugging shares and everything like that that led to the 1929 crash, that was really about the term democratizing finance. There were people like they are with Bitcoin right now, sitting there going, buy this, you'll be rich. You don't need to understand it. You don't need to comprehend it. Just buy it. Sit on it. You'll be rich. That was the promise then. That's the promise now with a lot of these people. So I'm very positive with Bitcoin. Um, just not what people say is Bitcoin. So if you were to sell me Bitcoins, because that's how it's being sold. It's an investment. Put your money in there. You're going to be rich. It's going to go to 100000 It's going to go to a million dollars. You know, it's going to go to that. How would you sell me what Bitcoin is? Explain to me, here's what Bitcoin is, dot, dot, dot. What would it be? I wouldn't. You I wouldn't would create plumbing. 
when a normal person buys a house, unless they're a little bit uh, sort of a perfectionist, I'll say it the nice way, um, pedantic on certain things, then they're not going to sit there going, well, I need this particular plumbing in this part of the house and these faucets and uh, I need ceramic um, here and I need copper there and yada, yada, yada. Now, the truth of the matter is you don't care about how your internet connection basically sends packets. You shouldn't care about how your money does it either. I don't want people sitting there and going, that they're some super wizard and, and know these things. I just want it to be secure plumbing. I want it to sit there in the background so that accountants and fraud analysts can review things and know that it's secure. I want it so that it's fast, it's better than Visa, that it costs less than PayPal, that people can hold their own cash again, which cash is disappearing. That's a bad thing. I want you to use Bitcoin. I don't want you to hoard it. The, the whole concept of having hoarded money is a pathology. It's wrong. If you want to save, good. If you want to build, good. If you want to create something. But this pathology about I'm, I'm going to get a lump of gold and hope that it goes up in value is wrong. How about actually taking something and building with it? If uh, we think about going into the um, uh, old parables, the, the parable of the servant. And I'm going to throw this one in there. The man who had his three servants and he gives each of them some money and one of them buries it under a rock. Well, he still has it at the end. But the one who spent it and did something and planted crops and, and worked, I mean, that's really what it's about. You don't make anything from having a lump of money sitting there. You make something by building things. Using money is what matters. Creating, investing. So, so based on what you're saying is Bitcoin is not a method of investment. Bitcoin was built to use, to, uh, uh, use meaning to purchase things that's cheaper than PayPal, not necessarily as a method of let me buy a bunch, let it sit, and then five, 10 years later, I sell it for more, make more money. Exactly. It's really about having a system that allows us to have micropayments more than anything else. So the internet has been crying out for micropayments for years. A decade ago, when I launched Bitcoin, people, everyone wanted to solve micropayments. Facebook are on Facebook coin version six now. Everyone's going, Libra, oh, whatever else, except this is version six. It has failed five times already. Amazon coin failed. They've all done these things and they keep trying because it is valuable to get digital money that can be sold in fractions of a cent. If you've got fees that are a dollar or even 20 cents, it doesn't work. You need fees of a tenth, of a hundredth, of a thousandth of a cent as it scales. Not this whole concept that we're going to take down the government and replace it with what? It's a concept of how do we no longer have advertising and hate speech rule the internet? How do we move Twitter away from basically incentivizing people from fighting? How do we disincentivize people terrorist groups from using these things to find people who they can uh, basically convert. If we don't have people sold, if we don't have their lives as part of this sort of, I guess, well, track where you are, monitor what you do, culture that Google and Facebook have created, then we have a different internet. What do you mean? Well, what, you, you just went to Twitter, Facebook. I know you're not a big fan of social media. And by the way, for full disclosure, for people to know this, you got a degree in theology. You, you studied theology coming up, right? I mean, that was uh, one of the things you studied coming up in college. Yeah. And, and 
And it seems like you have a challenge with Twitter because of what you just said right now with, you know, the way they make their money is uh, pinning people against each other. And I heard you say something about the fact that uh, uh, there's a problem with Twitter, Facebook, all these things being cheap and being free it shouldn't be free because if it is free you can use bots to create imaginary issues where were you it's, going it's with that? Can you on that the problem is it isn't free they are um, divisive they are many other things because they're not free people think that they're free they don't see the cost but whenever you have this free man, uh, sort of mantra it is in reality anything but free we have a system that sells you. You put in your information, you put in your photos, and they own it all. They get to use it all. They get copyright over what you're doing. They get access to all you're saying. They get to sell your information, basically to either governments or businesses or whatever else, so people can find out where you go, what you do. And then they can do that to promote advertising and um, and sales and whatever else and things you don't need or want and ideas that really shouldn't be there why because twitter makes a few cents every time so rather than having knowledge of what things actually cost we have a hidden cost now the sec back in 1999 actually took action against a number of decentralized companies who were saying um, that they were giving out shares and saying that they're uh, not covered because, well, uh, that new technology, they can do web IPOs, which is the modern word, uh, sorry, is called an ICO. And they were issuing shares if people signed up on their site. So you put in your, um, your name, address, and some personal information, and they gave you shares. And guess what? Every time you put a mere email address, back in 1999, when there weren't that many email addresses, when advertising wasn't that big, the SEC um, analyzed that and still came up back then with your information was worth $11 just by doing that little bit. So right now we're in a world where we have much more information, where the richness of information about your life if you have facebook on your phone is incredibly deep and now we're selling all that information and it's not eleven dollars anymore it's not cheap now facebook could make money without doing all this imagine if every day they got half a cent from you that would still be profitable Imagine half a cent from all their people. That'd be very profitable. That people could even have um, blog posts and whatever else that they sell, other things that they do online, and they could make money without having to have bank accounts set up, all sorts of things. Yet, that's not what we're doing because, well, billions of dollars of advertising, most of which is not really what anyone ever wants. If Facebook got a half a cent every day from every user at 2.2 billion, that's mm -hmm. 330 million a month times 12 is not a lot of money. It's 4 billion a year. They wouldn't be as profitable as they are today. Now, the, the, the negative, the negative. Uh, how right much do they get right now? Not in revenue, but in profit. In, in, it's a lot more than 4 billion. So a lot more than $4 billion. I mean, I know he lost money, $7 billion last week. But mm -hmm. the only reason I'm asking this is because I'm going business model now. You made me think mm -hmm. about business model, which is a completely different topic. Can a business model of charging me every day a certain amount really work for others to get in? Will it, can it scale to $2.2 mm -hmm. I, don't, yes. I don't know if we can scale to $2.2 billion users on, uh, on Facebook. But go, going back to, going back to uh, 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 crypto, let's, let's stay on that topic uh, uh, for a second because – I wanted to follow up with this here for, for folks who know Bitcoin. And here's what I've learned from a lot of people that claim they know Bitcoin. 99% of Bitcoin folks have no clue how this thing works. Mm -hmm. Would you agree with that? That, that majority uh, of people don't really know everything about Bitcoin. I'd even take it further. Okay. Uh, make it uh, um, know something about Bitcoin in 
who's involved in it, maybe one in 10,000. Okay, even better. I mean, I agree with you because it's so complex and people try to sound like they're experts and they know what they're doing, but it's a very technical issue. To make it comparable to another thing, I'll ask you, and maybe you can help me out with this, is would you be considered, if somebody, if you are Satoshi Nakamoto, are you comparable to a founder of a company, to a fund manager, to somebody who just happened to find gold mine? Who would that be comparable to? If you were to compare the founder to something, what would that be? Uh, I'm an issuer. Contrary to what people say, whenever you create something like Bitcoin Core created something, um, Vitalik created something, and everyone runs around going, there's no issuer. No, there is. I issued Bitcoin with all of the requirements for uh, sort of what that means and all the rest. And Vitalik issued Ethereum. And the people in Bitcoin Core issued BTC and other derivatives. So... The end of the day, everyone's running around, the law can't touch us. Of course it can. It's just slow. So what would I consider myself? I, I would say an inventor. We've got um, um, now uh, 1,080 patents, um, around 400 patent families filed. We have over 1,000 in the backlog uh, for white papers internally uh, at Enchain. Uh, by the time I finish with what we've already got, there'll be at least 6,000. So, I would say no. so. So, if you're an issuer, uh, uh, can you can you also, if you really wanted to, if somebody really pissed you off, let's just say somebody really pissed you off, mm. can you bring down the whole concept of Bitcoin if you wanted to? What is the concept of Bitcoin? Before I can answer that one, I'll need to know what the concept is that I'm bringing down. I mean, I'm talking about all of these folks that have money in Bitcoin, that have bought Bitcoin. Can you uh, essentially make Bitcoin go away where it's non-existent, where everybody loses all the value they have in Bitcoin? Um, well, that depends on what you're considering. So if you're looking at BTC, then that's already on shaky ground. Um, long term, uh, there's only going to be one system. Contrary to what people say with this whole, everyone will have their own money and whatever else. No, there won't be. It's like, how many different types of internet do you have? I mean, the reality is uh, we're not going to be on 50 different networks. Back 30 years ago, we had DECnet, ARPANET, um, DARPANET uh, which became internet. We had um, uh, Vanyan Bynes, uh, NetBuoy, um, Novell Netware. IPX, IP, uh, many, many different network protocols. The benefit in any system that is networked is connectivity between all the uh, interacting players. And there are still some uh, DECnet networks. There are still some Vanyan Bind networks globally. They're very small and they're legacy and people can't get rid of them. But the reality is no one cares about them. And that's where we're going to be. If Bitcoin's going to be something, it can't be a promise of a promise. So right now, you have people saying it's going to be valuable because it's going to be more valuable. That doesn't work. If you want Bitcoin to be valuable, it has to be because it's used. Not a promise that in the future we'll solve things, but because it's used. Not because it's decentralized. I mean... What does that really even mean? I mean, think about it. There's a, we're decentralized, but, and? What, what do you mean by decentralized? Uh, not that we have everyone voting, because you don't do that in Bitcoin. Contrary to the lies people tell you about how everyone gets a say, bull. Everyone doesn't get a say. BTC world, there are three developers who basically sit there and choose what happens. And in a manner analogous to Stalin, they sit there and go, you can vote for me. I will do everything I promise to do unless I don't. And if you don't like it, you can vote for me again. How much power and control those do three have though? If they lose it, they're furious, they're upset with everybody. What's the worst thing they can do? 
whatever they want. Which is? Break the network. They could, so you could essentially break the network if you wanted to. The only control here is legal. So this whole anarchist anti-government bit doesn't work. The reason you can't is because it's really a unilateral contract. It's the same as if I put contract, uh, like little stickers up saying, lost dog, I'll pay you 50 pounds if you find my dog. Now, the contract happens when someone decides to look for the dog, and if they find the dog, they're owed 50 pounds. But if they don't find the dog, I don't owe them anything. And that's the same thing in Bitcoin. So the developers have a unilateral contract, a promise to the miners and the community that they have to maintain. And right now, they change it all the time. So the only real protection is the fact that someone can sue them. Someone can actually hold them to account and a court can actually tell you, no, you, have, you can't do that. The same way Microsoft have been forced to change code. Google have been forced to change code. Amazon, Facebook, all these companies, even small companies get forced by courts to change code all the time. And sitting there going, you can't make us do. Well, of course you can make them do. Really? I mean, what a stupid statement saying you can't stop us. Well, of course you can. Where, where do you think you're going to put your code? Where do you think you're going to put your servers? This concept, we can just change the code and have new um, uh, sort of systems and the hash rate we can move. Really? And what? Then a new commercial entity will come in and have their equipment seized? Exchanges need to access banking. Right now, they can be cut off globally. I mean, um, I used to do a lot of work in um, the gaming industry, gambling, and I, I helped set up Lassiter's Casino and I helped um, other ones, licensed ones, that's the difference. And banking is important. You can be basically cut off at the, um, the knees instantly if a government decides they're not going to renew your banking license or your um, uh, exchange license or whatever else. So this, we can do whatever. It's a myth, a myth to sell something so that they can promote value that doesn't exist. It isn't about we're going to have billions of transactions and everyone will actually be able to sell things online. It is no longer any of these promises that everyone said about global money. Money needs to be used. Money isn't just a store of value. Store of value is a secondary part of money. And it doesn't even mean what these people are saying. Store of value means it stays the same value. The Ideal value store in the US is the US dollar. Full stop. Because by definition, a store of value in economics means something that a year later from now, you will pay that with a contract at the same rate. It will be worth the same, not more, not less. If it is worth a cent more, it is less of a um, unit of value than if it was the same thing. If it's worth a cent less, the same. The ideal store of value is a dollar when you're in America. The error people are making is thinking that it's about investment value. Store of value by de definition isn't anything to do with investment. It's to do with stability. So, what, what percentage of Bitcoin right now is being used to purchase items? Oh, very, very small. Um, there was more monetary value of Bitcoin spent um, in 2011 than there is now. What, what's causing that? This mantra of gambling that Bitcoin's a way of making money without tax, that whatever else. I think majority of um, sort of sales are onto exchanges for people wanting to make money without being taxed and things like this. 
And which is really stupid because they're going to find out that they have no money. The requirements are already in place. The laws are already in place. It takes time to kick in. So in um, 18 months from now, the provisions in um, Money Laundering Directive number five that hits Europe and Britain, and it will be a criminal act to have wallets that don't link to identity and hold more than 150 euros worth of value. There's not much money. Uh, uh, Craig, let me ask you, right now, Bitcoin, as of right now, I just ran it, it's 9,226, okay, mm -hmm. right now. Is, is Bitcoin more likely to go to $100,000 or more likely go to $100? BTC is not going to go to $100,000. Full stop. It's not going to go to $100,000? No. If you're somebody that's an analyst and you're making a prediction, are you saying higher or lower? Lower. How much lower? In time, a lot. The problem is, I mean, people don't realize, people forget. So go back 20 years. We had digital money. We had industries doing this. Bigger than now. Who? So we had eGold, Mnet, um, a whole lot of peer things that were having people invest money into Ponzi's once again. And with the stock market crash and all the rest, they went basically bust. They all disappeared. So just believing things will go up because they'll go up doesn't work. This is dogfood.com. If you don't have something here that actually makes money, that actually does the work, that is an empty promise, eventually it ends. It means Amazon, not dogfood.com. If you don't have a system that transfers more volume every day at a lower rate, more efficiently, more effectively than, say, um, um, Visa and MasterCard and all these other things, if they're not using your system as a transmission system, then eventually someone's going to replace you. Suddenly they're going, we're Bitcoin. No, sorry. You either build something better or else. That's just the way the world works. You may not like it, doesn't matter. This is how it is. People are fickle. We want to see you doing things. We want to see you build things. And this concept that there are everyone who will ever get into Bitcoin based on a store of value that goes up on, on price, the Ponzi scam, they're here. They're no more. They're gone. That's it. The whole, everyone you'll be able to scam is right here in Bitcoin. The rest of the people out there don't care. The rest of the people will care when this is digital cash. Not that they make money on, that they use. Until that happens, it's not happening. It's a pretty bold prediction right there to say you are Satoshi Nakamoto and it's 9,226 and it's got more likelihood of going to $100 than it does to well, go to $100,000. I don't consider BTC Bitcoin. Um, I mean, there's no SegWit in Bitcoin. The concept of what they're selling is not what I created. So, By the way, how did it become a religion? How did it become such a attract a cult-like following type of a person? Because typically... In order for something to have a cult-like following, there must be a founder that has a cult-like following of a spirit, a.k.a. Steve Jobs, you know, a person who has that aura and that feeling and we're going to take over the world. How did this become that without somebody that was a prophet claiming what this is going to replace? In my absence, people created a mythology. Unfortunately, uh, that's what happened. So uh, people sit there saying, this is what I meant. No, what I meant was fairly clear. When I argued with people and I said, uh, Bitcoin ends in data centers, I meant Bitcoin ends in data centers. Full stop. I did not mean that everyone sits there at home going, we're going to solve blocks for the sake of it. It's not designed for that. The truth of the matter is that that's what people don't want to hear. They, they, 
these people in the, the whole little cultish version of Bitcoin don't want me to sit there and say the reason for proof of work in Bitcoin is purely and simply to make sure nodes cannot ever be anonymous. The 2016 block um, sort of difficulty adjustment period is so that there can never be more than 2,000 nodes. And in reality, because you have a power law distribution of um, investment, you never have more than 100. Right now, we have 32. From 2011 till now, every single node is known. And we had 98 in that entire period. Nine years, 98 nodes. And it's very simple to tell whether you're a node. Have you created a block? Full stop. You say for this thing to work, it's got to people. People got to spend the the Bitcoin and purchase things, and yeah. not a lot of it to, is being spent. Is it fair to say it's less than one percent of Bitcoins being used to purchase items? Is that a fair assessment? It is a fair assessment. Yes. Okay. So if if you uh, uh, have the monkey or Satoshi Nakamoto, and that as of today, give or take, is worth eight point eight billion dollars. How come you're not spending uh, that money uh, purchasing items so it's, you know, moving? How come you're not doing it? Well, uh, first of all, I do. Um, second, you can't actually spend that much money um, in Bitcoin and derivatives like BTC. Uh, the liquidity is not there. You can't go out there and spend a billion dollars, full stop. So if you try and move $100 million, the value of Bitcoin is going to go right down. So there isn't $8 billion there. That's just an arbitrary um, sort of artificial thing that people say. The reality is if uh, even without people knowing it was me, if there's a way of doing it, if I could try and spend everything, there might be $50 million out of this by the time if I tried to dump it all at once. Um, what's the, what's if I did it over time, I might be able to get five times that and, and have 250. That would be it. What's the biggest purchase you've made with a Bitcoin? Um, paid for a number of things. I've, paid, I've had a uh, rather extravagant holiday. Um, I've got um, a little bit of artwork. Um, I mean, most of my stuff though is boring. Um, my university fees are probably my biggest um, expense every year. Uh, is it, but, but amount, if you were to, even if you don't disclose what it is, what is the amount that was the biggest purchase you were able to make with Bitcoin? Oh, the purchase, biggest purchase I'd say would be 50 grand. 50, do, do we know what is the biggest purchase ever made with Bitcoin or no? Is that public info? No, it's not really public, no. So no one would know what kind of a purchase has been made. That's the biggest purchase with Bitcoin. Well, not no one would know, but it's not public. This is the whole thing. The ledger doesn't say who said um, what and who got what and where it went. So there's a ledger information there, but that then aligns with individuals and what they have. So what, who's, who's been the biggest, most credible source of investor that bought the biggest amount of Bitcoin? Is that public info or no? Um, there are a number of those, but I don't know what the biggest would be. I, I mean, I wouldn't say investor anyway. I'd say mostly gamblers. Um, investor, don't know. Sorry. Is, is Peter Thiel one of the bigger proponents of Bitcoin? Would you say he's one of them? I'd be surprised if he is. But You'd be surprised if he is. Is, is there a well-known person that's an analyst, hedge fund, somebody that came out and said, we're going to go buy this much Bitcoin? You're talking to the wrong person on that. Sorry. Interesting. Interesting that, uh, uh, why, why wouldn't you know that though? That, that doesn't interest you at all with uh, how investors and analysts look at uh, Bitcoin? Not really. I don't see them as investors. I see them as gamblers. So I'm not working in the gaming industry anymore and I don't really care about how people gamble their money. Um, at the end of the day, my purpose is to go out there and build things, to um, create inventions and whatever else. Uh, there's a lot that needs to be done before Bitcoin really um, sort of succeeds where it needs to be. Um, 
a lot of the things I've been working on, such as um, properly scaled SPV and whatever else, uh, all need to be implemented. Um, and that's going to take quite a number of years. And um, uh, the technology is far more interesting than how people sort of flip their money. Why don't you sell all your Bitcoin? Why don't you sell it and cash out? Um, and do what? And I mean, sell all my Bitcoin and cash out. So um, one, I won't get that much money. Uh, even as an OTC trade, I'd get less. And, and then what? You just I mean, said you have a lot of other technology you'd want to go create. You, you can use that quarter of a billion dollars to go build new technology. Code. We're building new technology now. I mean, we've, we've already got, Enchain's already um, uh, several hundred people around the world. Uh, we've got offices in multiple continents. Um, uh, we've got over a thousand patent filings now. I mean, um, your assumption is that selling Bitcoin is necessary. But why wouldn't you? I mean, wouldn't it, wouldn't it, uh is sitting on it, isn't that hurting the narrative on the fact that this is not being used as a currency? Why not move it? Why not put it elsewhere? I move Bitcoin now. I spend with Bitcoin where I can. So again, you're, you're thinking that if I've got money in a bank, I don't go out there every day and see what I can spend. Do you make most of your purchases on Bitcoin or is it the combination cash, credit, Bitcoin? Oh, of course not. I mean, if I could make most of my purchases on Bitcoin, I would. The reality here is I can't. There's actually um, less opportunity than there was in 2013, 2014. Um, as the BTC price has gone up, many people have just abandoned the whole concept of using Bitcoin as a monetary system. And it's left it with the gamblers. So there's actually, it's actually harder to spend Bitcoin right now than it was. What's the biggest commercial company that is allowing purchases being made by Bitcoin? A very well-known company that you can go and buy with Bitcoin. Um, don't know of any. Don't know any. So if I wanted to go into Apple, Ford, you know, uh, Walmart and Amazon, I can't make any of the purchases with Bitcoin today. No, and that's a problem. Do you think so it's been used to be Microsoft? But, I mean. Uh, it used to be Microsoft, but we made things too difficult. We'll, we'll elaborate if you don't mind. Well, people will take Bitcoin when it's cheap and easy. When you have fees that are variable and go up and down and, um, and are more than a cent, then you don't have an online cash system anymore. Very interesting. Uh, you know, when, when, you, when you did the interview with... BBC, Wall Street Journal, uh, I, I want to say 2016 or 2017. I don't know the exact timeline. I think it was around 2016 when he did the interview. And, you know, the, the gentleman that's interviewing you uh, is asking, you know, why are you doing this interview? I said, yeah, I'm doing this interview, but uh, that doesn't mean I have to bounce around in TV cameras. I don't want money. I don't want fame. I don't want adoration. I just want to be left alone. Yes. And then you said, uh, the gentleman asked you, says, why now? Why have you decided to identify yourself as Satoshi Nakamoto? You said, I didn't decide. I had people decide this matter for me, and they're making life difficult, not for me, but my friends, family, and staff. They want to be private. I don't want any one of them to be impacted by this. None of it is true. There are a lot of stories out there that are made up. I'm going to do this once and once only. I'm going to come in front of camera once, and I will never, ever be seen on camera ever again for any TV station or any media ever. What changed? Those people didn't stop. Those people kept their, their BS up. People like Mr. Maxwell and others in core um, have been attacking me for years now. Not 2015 when they released a whole lot of fake information. Not right now. They were contacted by the tax office in Australia. Um, I'd been, um, I actually contacted them. I was talking to the tax office. And of course, the tax office decided to verify things, but instead of doing it properly, they talked to people like Mr. Antonopoulos and Greg Maxwell and things like this, who told them, no, that's not how Bitcoin works. You can't tax Bitcoin. Uh, it's all hidden. Um, and this guy's scamming you. And of course, none of those people wanted uh, a version of Bitcoin that was honest and 
worked within the law and the tax offices could manage. So they made up stories about me and they've been doing it ever since. And so you're coming out to defend the position over and over again? Well, I didn't really even come out. I mean, uh, in December 2015, this whole fake swatting and raid. I mean, I moved to uh, the UK here in October 2015. Um, and then you have these fake media things. Does anyone ever ask why there happens to be a secret raid on someone with television cameras just waiting there? I mean, think about it for a moment. In an empty house. So not where I'm living, not in the country I've been living for months, where everyone knew because all my, my tax things and everything were finalised. Imagine that you've got camera crews sitting outside somewhere. That means someone's told them these things. Camera crews don't randomly just sit there waiting so think about this. Does that sound like it just randomly happens? Like a whole lot of camera crews are just sitting there waiting for a, um, a group of police to run in and swat a house? And then stories come out about things? I mean, no one seems to think anymore. They don't question things. They, they just assume what they're being fed by the media must be correct. What, what was the media feeding about you? Uh, is the, are you saying the media is the media's feeding people that you are not Satoshi Nakamoto? Or what is the media feeding? Well, that was part of it. Um, we had a lot of sort of, and we still get a lot of people wanting to discredit what I'm doing. So um, this whole concept is whatever I do is bad. So Satoshi would never patent, must be hell finny. Hell Finney, of course, actually had patents. And most of the guys in core have patents. And most of the other people who hypocritically sit there saying, no, can't be Craig because have patents. Just I do it better. So then they sit there saying, oh, well, you copied this, except you don't get a patent by copying something. And it's easy to make the claim saying, uh, look, this is just, just a Diffie-Hellman process, except if you write a patent well, which we do, you have to actually do this section called prior art. And in prior art, you put all the things that already exist and you explain why you're different to them. So if you want to have a really good patent, you sit there and you document how things really are now. This is the existing intellectual property. These are the existing inventions. You know, like uh, when you document other people's work um, in other things, and you basically put that there, and then you say, but this is my invention. And what you actually have patented is your invention, not the previous things. But most people have never filed a patent. Most people have never done a thesis. So, when people sit there and, and comment on these things, it's without knowledge, without understanding. And it's very easy to sit there on social media these days. And this is part of the problem with things like Twitter. You can sit there and say, oh, isn't that terrible? But you don't care about the truth. You don't care about what's real. Because we have this whole culture now. I'm not doing something. I'm not actually going out there and making a better world because we don't need to anymore. We can click like. I didn't actually have to go out there and, and help that person because I liked the video of them suffering. I said that it was really terrible. I saw and I felt and I emoted online. And I said, I feel so bad. And other people came back to me and said, we feel bad for you. That's our world now if we want to go back to a biblical thing, it's the Good Samaritan, except the Good Samaritan's the one who isn't on social media. Everyone else walking along, they're the ones who are on social media. The Pharisees who pass the guy and watch him bleed, but they get back and they tweet about it. And they say, 
he was bleeding. But I'm really good because I made sure I stayed pure. If I got blood on my hands, I wouldn't be able to go to the temple on, on Sabbath. And then the next group come through and they sit there and they say, I'm so pure because obviously I'm with other people and, and we could have been attacked. And we want to live in fear, don't we? We don't want to do something because poor little me. But what a, it's not just me. What about these people I'm with? What about them? I, mean, I know there's only probably two attackers and there's like 10 of us, but, but what, what if some of us get hurt? So we walk on. And that's what our world is becoming. We leave the people there. We sit there and we click on people and we say, isn't this great? Because look what I've done. I've helped by clicking like. You haven't. And all these people who think they have, you're scum. And if you don't like that, get off your freaking ass and do something about it. What, what, what part of the question I asked made you want to go there? I asked you a question saying about what the media's uh, uh, saying about you, and then you went to that part about the Good Samaritan, but uh, what, what made you want to constantly come out and talk about the fact that you're Satoshi Nakamoto? Who cares what they did about you? Who said I did? The media. This is all the media. Facebook, all these other things, the media. You're saying that I did. I didn't. You, you didn't come out and say it? You said constantly. I said I would do something and go away, and then no one goes away. Yeah. So I didn't. Uh, all these other people put out other things and and whatever else. So I didn't sit there going, this is what I'm going to do for you. I'm going to be your great leader. I'm going to lead your revolution. I didn't sit there in 2010 um, coming out and going, hey, I'm, I'm Satoshi. I want to give interviews. I didn't do it in 2017 even. I didn't want to sit there and say, look, I am. I was just building. I was building a working version of electronic cash that scales. We're already doing millions of transactions at the moment, building something that works. But that's what scares people. Because guess what? Something that works kills off all the little false mantras about Ponzi schemes that make you money by doing nothing. So why am I going there? Because this is there. This is what people are doing. The, the media exists because those people who do nothing, those people who watch, those people who voyeuristically sit there and think that the world is going to move because they watch TV or they watch YouTube or they watch whatever else. That's the problem. So, so there, are, there are a few names involved when it comes down to Satoshi uh, Nakamoto. You're obviously one of them. You mentioned mm -hmm. another one which is Hal Finney, who was also there early at the beginning. And then there's also another one named uh, uh, Dave uh, Kleiman, who I believe Dave uh, sued you for some $5.2 billion. No, Dave's estranged brother. So Dave was my friend. Dave died in 2013. In February 2018, this, the estate, you're right, the estate of Dave Kleiman Initiated a lawsuit at the U.S. District Court for Southern District of Florida against Wright over the rights of $5.118 billion worth of Bitcoin claiming that Wright defrauded claiming of Bitcoins and intellectual property rights. Yes, except um, I won't go into detail on that because it's an ongoing case. But here's the point for you. If you haven't moved it, how have you stolen it? It's like saying, well, um, here's the bar of gold. It's sitting in the safe deposit box. It has never moved. Um, you must have stolen it because I've lost the keys. You've lost the keys. Not me. They're saying that. They lost the keys, so therefore uh, you stole it. So they lost the keys to Dave's Bitcoin, but they're saying you stole it. Yes. Because and, it hasn't moved. But do you have the keys to yours or you, you don't have access to it? Because I know you also told in court testimony last year that you also don't have access to your uh, Bitcoin. Uh, that's not exactly what I said, and 
I didn't say they were mine. I said there was a trust. But um, as I said, I'm not going to go into detail about the court case. It's ongoing. So, so okay, let's set the money aside that it's ongoing case. But let's go back to Dave. So yourself, Hal, and Dave were involved at the beginning stage with you leading it. Um, not the way you're making out. There were a few people online. Um, Hal helped in the term. Uh, basically, I sent out code to people that they reviewed. Um, so was he Satoshi? No. Uh, but like many other people, they could have taken an active interest. It was a experimental project at that stage. And if people wanted to be involved, they could have been. Have, uh, so have you ever met Hal Finney? Not physically, no. Never have. Okay. But, but Dave was a friend of yours. Yes, Dave was. Okay, then there's another person that comes out that's uh, Adam Beck. Do you have a relationship with Adam? Um, only from Twitter and other such things. So you and Adam have never met each other? Not physically, no. Um, I've jousted with him since 2014 online. Um, I spoke with him uh, over email and whatever else in 2008. But um, no, Adam's, Adam's not the brightest guy in the bunch, but... Um, unfortunately, um, he's easily to, uh, for other people to manipulate, is the best way to put it. Adam's not the brightest guy of the bunch? You're saying Adam is not bright? I mean, you know, listen, when I bring up your name and people talk shit about you, I'm like, listen, you can't say Craig is not brilliant. You can say a lot of things about a lot of people. You can't say Craig is not brilliant. I mean, Adam got his PhD in distributed computing systems which is a perfect background to build a decentralized computer network. I mean, Adam's... No, actually, that's not... That's what he says now. So Adam's um, thing is on a type of parallel code system that has nothing to do with anything like Bitcoin. And Adam didn't invent proof of work, contrary to what he says. His, the system in Bitcoin isn't the system that Adam invented in Hashcash. Adam was... Um, the only one who answered my emails at the time. The system used in Bitcoin is by Aurora et al., um, which was years before Adams. Now, they actually had uh, exactly analogous, apart from um, different Shar algorithm, um, the same sort of methodology of taking the number of zeros and whatever else. Adam, on the other hand, had a proof-of-work system where he matched up words and um, basically... Uh, sold tokens individually. It was more along the lines of Tim May's idea of everyone having their own money. That's Adam. Yes. But Adam doesn't admit this. Adam tries to gloss over everything and say, yes, I invented that form of, um, of proof of work. And basically, Bitcoin's just hash cash with um, a couple other enhancements. And, and of course, so therefore, it's all mine. So that's Adam. Okay, so in 2016, Financial Times cited back as potential Nakamoto candidate along with Nick Zabo and Hal Finney. Uh, no, they didn't. A contributor. So Financial Times contributor. That's basically like an advertiser. So an advertiser in Financial Times, not staff, not a writer, See, this is the problem with Forbes and Financial Times and whatever else. They allow people to blog for money on their sites. So, and they sit there calling this, uh, like people say that Financial Times said, no, they didn't. There's little tiny links up the top saying contributors and things like this. No. Contributors are just advertisers. They're just shilling. Then it says in 2020, a YouTube channel called Barely Sociable claimed that Back was Nakamoto. Back denied it. Craig Wright had sued Back because Back stated that Wright was not Nakamoto, with Wright subsequently dropping the suit. Is that also a contributor, or did that happen? Uh, not exactly the way it was. Um, what actually happened was we couldn't get hold of Back to serve him. Um, I was attempting to, um, to sue him for defamation, not because he didn't call me... Um, Satoshi or whatever else, which I didn't care. Um, uh, but um, the same day we, we, we couldn't track him down, uh, the same day 
that um, uh, we, we gave up trying to find him and serve him uh, and filed in the court that we were giving up uh, wasting money running after the world trying to get him as he hid, um, he got served. <laughs> so, ironically, um, so it wasn't quite the way they're making out. So are you saying it's not right about Adam Beck that he doesn't have a PhD in distributing computing systems? It's not distributed computing systems, no. It is um, to do with um, parallel code. It's, so, no. It's, again, take a PhD, yes. Um, yes, it's a computer science one. No, it's not in this area. No, Hashcash is not a distributed computing system. No, Hashcash isn't the proof-of-work system used in Bitcoin. So did you get a PhD yourself in, com in uh, 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 computing systems or no, yourself? Uh, computer science and economics. Okay, because then there's another thing that was sent over to me is the fact that the Wright claimed to have a PhD computer science from Charles Stewart University on his LinkedIn profile as of 2015, but the university told Forbes that it was only awarded. No, no, the university told nobody. Forbes didn't write anything. A contributor using Forbes. This was also an article. This Sorry? was also a contributor? Yes. Have a look at the top of the thing where it says contributor. I mean, this is the problem. Link. People keep saying that these things are real. They don't understand that just because it says Forbes, Forbes are selling their brand down to get money because that's what they do these days. Which, by the way, you are right about that. So I'm, I'm giving you credit. The fact that there are contributors that you can pay $2,000 or $4,000 to say I'm a writer for Forbes, but it's really, you can write anything you want. There's not really an approval process. So oh no, it's terrible. Yeah, but then it says the University of Forbes had only awarded two master's degree and not a doctorate, right? PhD from CSU was finally awarded February, 2017. Is there accuracy to this or no? Because I know you were saying you're still going to university. Uh, one, it was three masters. I had to drop one um, um, because other people complained that I was actually enrolled in multiple degrees, which I was. The university did know about it, but. Um, the pressure on the university, I uh, dropped that one, uh, like one and a half courses before I was finished it. Um, the um, submission of my doctorate for that one was done earlier. Uh, what I said was I had a doctorate. My doctorate, the other one, which uh, I wasn't um, arguing about, which people bitch about because it's not computer science, was theology. Um, I also have many other degrees at the same time. I still study. I'm not out of university yet. I'm still in there. Um, I'm actually um, uh, writing my thesis in law uh, over here in the UK at the moment. Uh, so I have multiple things. You just don't know half of what I had. And uh, I don't actually manage any of my social media other than Slack. So... Uh, I can't even say what was on anything like that. I don't know. I mean, I don't run LinkedIn. I don't run Facebook. Uh, I don't have a Twitter account. So I won't vouch for anything that any of these things say because I don't run social media. I was on Twitter for a while and that's it. Sorry. But by the way, you're obviously a very interesting individual. October 1970, I'm also an October baby. What, what day in October were you born? 23rd. You're 23rd. Interesting. 23rd. October 23rd. And yourself. Say that again. And yourself. I'm 18th. I'm five days before you, except not 70. I'm 78. So we're eight years apart. You are eight years, uh, seven years and 51 weeks older than me. To be exact. I know you're a numbers guy. I have to give you the exact mm -hmm. specific numbers. So we're accurate there. So but going back to this Adam Back, it's very interesting when I look at this. You know, here's what... Uh, 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 I, I, I don't think this is a best friend of yours, John McAfee. It is somebody you know of, John McAfee. We've, oh, we've had John, John is a scamming bastard, and there's only no nice thing to ever say about John. I mean, um, yeah, John, John hasn't done anything good in his life that I know of. I mean, he's taken other people's code and bloody uh, McAfee and scammed people out of things there, and then he's scamming people again. His whole thing is, how do I make money quickly? Here's one thing he did say. By the way, we've had John McAfee on when we went to his place, and it's a very interesting interview. It's, it's very, very – it's the only time where somebody knocked on a door and uh, one of his guys ran to the door with a gun in his hand, which is quite uh, unique. We've never had that before in the middle of an interview. Here's what he did say when a guy asked him, 
who is Satoshi Nakamoto, he said in Satoshi's white paper, every word that has dual spellings for American and British English is British. Every sentence is followed by two spaces. There are only two of the Qs that are British, and only one of those two has two spaces in every single of his papers. Run some authoring so software, which he's alluding to back, being the Satoshi Nakamoto. I mean, there is, because you're from Australia, he's from UK, you know, he's from Britain. So there's a little bit of that when you look at the data on how he wrote code, what, how it could go back to being him. What are your thoughts on that? Um, number one, um, I write with double space or single space, depending on what I'm publishing. Um, I write in English, um, UK English or um, American English, depending on where I'm writing. Um, I am writing um, with some US universities at the moment. And when I do that, I pr uh, produce in APA 7 at the moment. And um, that is different to the standard I use when I'm writing here in Leicester. Uh, and Leicester is a British university. So that, because it's a law degree, requires different things. So I write basically on what I have to write. So when I'm publishing in a certain type of paper, I publish a certain way. Now, my choice would, would have been Australian English at the beginning, which is basically British English with a few uh, extra words. Um, but um, in 2008, uh, I was completing my Masters of Law at Northumbria in the UK. And um, so most of how I wrote was how I would write when I'm doing law, sometimes for accounting purposes. Interesting. Interesting to know that when you're, when you're sharing that. But again, that was that perspective. And then I'll give you this last one here, and then we'll go into speed round, is uh, here's about Adam back. So, you know... Adam has no clue about Bitcoin. I mean, you can waste all the time you want going, Adam back has this, that, and the other. Adam back doesn't have a clue about how Bitcoin works. He has no idea about the economics of the system, the legality of the system. He doesn't have an idea how any of it works. Um, and basically, he didn't even realize that the proof of work system in Bitcoin isn't like his. So if he was such an expert in it, why didn't he actually pick up on the differences? So sorry. No, he's not doing it to hide. He really doesn't even understand the basics of Bitcoin yet. He doesn't even understand the basics of Bitcoin. That's a, that's a, that's a pretty strong statement to say that. No, no, no that, that's being really nice. <laughs> this is camera. <laughs> really? Like you, you're going there with Adam Beck to say he has no clue what he's doing when it comes down to Bitcoin. Adam came into this in 2013 and basically the whole thing was, I got mentioned on the white paper, aren't I wonderful? And that's all he's ever done. And he does whatever the hell gets him likes. Adam doesn't care about actually creating anything in Bitcoin, building anything. He hasn't. Adam cares that people like what he says. Now, that short term might work. But long term, you don't get anything out of it. So imagine if you were Thomas Edison. You can actually try and make a better light bulb by trying thousands of experiments and doing things and not being liked. Or you can sit there and say how wonderful you are. And for a little while, people will remember you. And they'll, they'll say, wow, isn't that great? He looks good. What wonderful flim flam. Except guess what? You don't build anything. They haven't built anything. Nothing. Yeah, so, some, some people may say he's Nikola Tesla and you're trying to be Edison, which is Nikola's the one that came up with the idea, but Edison took credit for it. Well, actually... That's actually wrong, too. I know a lot of people love to say that one recently. Um, the Wikipedia era. Um, Edison wasn't necessarily what you would call a nice guy um, in any sense of the word. But 
Tesla wasn't the one who came up with things. Tesla was a very good media man. What Tesla did was every single day he did little shows. He did things with um, like showing electricity between um, basically two electrodes and sparks and, and the media loved him. He was a showman and he worked with other people and he got his name on a lot of patents with other people, some of which ended up suing him. Um, so he wasn't dumb. He wasn't, uh, but he's nowhere near this person that people are making him out to be now. Uh, but there's value in creating this mythology about the showman. And more than anything else, he was a showman. So you relate more to uh, the, the asshole Edison than the nice showman Nikola Tesla? Unfortunately, yes. Uh, <laughs> but I work. I work. I get up in the morning. I work. I spend my day working. I study. Um, so, I mean, most people don't realize uh, what it is to really work. Um, at the moment, I'm not doing a PhD. I'm doing a PhD and multiple other degrees simultaneously full time. And I'm not going to say what they all are because I'll have people bitching going, you're doing X, Y, and Z. That's not right. And, um, and pressuring the unis who already know that I've done some of these things in the past and that I've told. Um, but yeah, it's just easier not to have to respond. So I'm not going to say. It's easier not to have to respond. Um, well, at the end of the day, I'm not going to get any employment opportunities or anything like that ever again because of qualifications or anything. I do this for me. I don't do it because, I mean, I've got, I think, 20-something degrees now. And that's actually a negative if you think about it, uh, if you actually put that out there. No one hires me because I have sort of qualifications in um, art history and music and computer science. No one cares. They actually see that as a negative. But I see it as a positive because, for instance, uh, just yesterday, we, I put in a white paper to go to, to be filed as a patent um, based on some of the things I've been doing in an art history degree, which I'm not going to say because the patent hasn't been filed yet, but um, it's to do with certain types of ancient painting techniques and whatever else um, and how Sotheby's and others can actually manage uh, and maintain records of, um, of artwork. So uh, the reality is by having a diverse mix of knowledge, I actually find out more things that I could actually do. Yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's very interesting uh, to, obviously, this topic of Satoshi Nakamoto. It's so, everybody is uh, wanting to find out who it really is. Some are saying you, some are saying other people. I don't think many people, I mean, in the community, yes, people run around saying all these things, not wanting to be me. But the reality is, um, if you don't really, if I'm not going to make money doing the thing, uh, selling myself um, and prostituting myself into conferences, uh, if I don't take money to present, if I'm not doing any of that, what's it matter? I mean, when I file uh, a patent, when I create something, when I write papers, it's all peer reviewed. So when I have a patent application, I don't go, hey, I'm Satoshi, give me a patent. It goes before examiners. And those examiners have no idea who I am. And that's a good thing. This is why it doesn't matter. No one cares. I mean, when I create, um, when the company creates, when we all sit there and we build things and whatever else, and we sell code that's plumbing, most people don't know, they don't care. It works best that way. I, I mean, I actually like being plumbing. I like the other. Um, I... I have Asperger's and I find face-to-face -face conversations with people difficult. I find interacting with people difficult. That's why most of my degrees have been distance and, and now online for most of my life. Why I do these things, why I um, sort of have unusual work habits and all the rest, because at the end of the day, um, it's just, it sort of 
fits with what I am. And this concept of I'm going to go out there and, and run around and be eccentric and have everyone love me, I don't really care. I don't want that. I'm happiest because I build things. And here's the thing that everyone can sit there and throw shit at me all you want. In five years' time, I'm likely to have my name on maybe three, 4,000 patents and I'll still be patenting. The technologies needed to make any blockchain work. Well, no one wanted to listen to me. So as you see them come out, as we show how we scale to millions and billions of transactions a second, then too bad. That's all I have to say. I mean, if you think that I need to have your approbation, that I need your love and your basically worship, then you're insane. I've had, I've had an executive on my team who had Asperger's that I work with. And we, we one day were sitting and having a conversation together and the topic of Bill Gates came up because Bill Gates also has been claimed to have had uh, mm. Asperger's. And there's been a lot of people, by the way, lots of successful people. Mm. What, what, why do you think there's a link between Asperger's and genius? Meaning they're able to do things and process issues in ways that the average person can't. What is it? I've heard a lot of different theories. I'm curious to know what you say about it. I think there are a couple different areas. One, uh, we don't have the same level of distraction as some other people. Um, I hyper-focus on tasks, uh, which actually annoys many people I know because you just get into something and they try and talk to you and it's, uh-huh. They say, the house is burning down, uh-huh. Um, someone's running off with the children, uh-huh. I mean, but true. you're into it. You're, it's there. And you find something that you obsess about. And not many other people would have done Bitcoin because they didn't obsess. Everyone gave up on Bitcoin um, as a concept back in about 2001. That's when everything really started falling apart. 2003, everything was dead in cryptocurrency space. Everyone told me how stupid I was by actually still thinking about how we do online payments and how you do these things. Um, lots of problems. Lots of people uh, wanted to pull funding from me and all sorts of things in the past um, because it's not solvable. It's not worth it. Find something else. And I kept obsessing. And everyone else is out there going off and finding other things. and. Um, I kept obsessing. I tried this, I tried that. And that's the whole thing. So you get certain types of people who, if their focus is on something that needs to be solved, will just put everything into it until they solve it. Um, I had a older guy that I knew in Australia who, well, uh, ended up actually doing quite well when he was about 80. Uh, but he, he grew orchids and he obsessed over them. And he spent like 50 years breeding and doing orchids and everything like that. And um, now these days, suddenly orchids are being sold everywhere and um, he has um, uh, rights to a number of um, things that he sold. And everyone thought, I mean, 50 years worth of what everyone thought was wasting time, money, effort and all the rest. And now that he's 80, he's suddenly getting money in, which is unfortunate because he's that old and, but it helps his family still. But that's the point. If you have someone who obsesses that way, that will try things. I mean, Edison didn't invent the light bulb. People get that wrong. Arc lighting existed. Filament lighting existed. But it didn't work because uh, it would burn out after like an hour. And having a light bulb you change every hour, yeah, no one wants to change light bulbs every hour. So he sat there basically experimenting with every material, every way he could do it until he had one that lasted days and then longer and longer and longer. And the, the sort of obsession that I have for knowledge for other things 
not many people, it, it's, I mean, one way of putting it would be it's a form of insanity. And a lot of people like myself have this form of insanity, but it's a socially acceptable form of insanity. So I will sit there and I will digest knowledge. I will read and learn and everything I can. And that's how I'm happiest. I mean, um, people don't really get this. Um, I think my wife has accepted it, but she doesn't understand it. But like we were um, a few years ago um, on a yacht in um, uh, the Mediterranean and the kids and everything are having fun doing the whole fall off the back into the, the nice blue water bit and all the rest. And I'm sitting up there on the top writing and working. <laughs> and I can see that. But, but you said two things. So one was uh, when it comes down to distractions, you're, you're able to stay hyper-focused on tasks. So people say, yeah, yeah, yeah. What, what's this? Is the second one that there's not that much emotions where you're not offended as much as another person is? Um, no, but in a different way. Um, people think that myself and, and a lot of others don't feel that we don't emote. We don't show it. So, and we don't react. So, um, my wife looks at me strangely because I don't react to pain the normal way. Um, something happens and I have an injury and she sits there going, isn't that really painful? And I go, yes, it is incredibly painful, honey. And she goes, um, but you don't look like you're in pain. And I went, I am. <laughs> so that causes people sort of, a, it doesn't match up right. right? So, um, uh, I mean, I've done lots of um, silly things. I used to own a farm. And if you want to injure yourself, I actually still own a farm. I just never get back to Australia. Um, but if you want to injure yourself a lot, um, have a ranch. <laughs> <laughs> uh, between fencing with barbed wire and um, heavy equipment and tractors and everything like that, <laughs> injuries galore. So that was interesting. Very good feedback there. Sensitivity for me from working with Asperger's, they're extremely sensitive to the point where they will do whatever they can to prove you wrong of going out there and doing their research to say, I told you I was right. There's a different kind of a, would you agree with that? A little bit of that going on? Uh, am I a pedantic asshole? And asshole has to be the word after pedantic. Yes. Um, I actually had an argument with uh, my psychologist um, who was discussing the, um, the, the concept of uh, like the word weird because I was saying I, I didn't like the use of the word weird in one of the quizzes he'd given me because um, and um, the word weird actually is used utterly wrong. I mean, when you talk about the weird sisters in um, Shakespeare in, in, um, in Macbeth, the three sisters, it's the fate so weird actually is the fates, the control, the, um, if you, you think about the, um, uh, the concept from, from Greek and, uh, and then Roman sort of copy of what we see as mythology as, as fates and how they control our lives, that's what weird is. Uh, we just use it wrong. So I, I get into the etymology of words, which I, I find interesting. I, uh, uh, and yeah, not many people want to be told that they're saying things that are not correct. <laughs> By the way, what, how old were you when you realized you had Asperger's? How old were you? Did somebody say it to you? Did you go to the doctor? How old were you? Um, um, oh, I know I, I had um, uh, diagnosed. My, my mother had me um, in front of psychologists when I was in high school. Um, and then they sort of, uh, I ended up going to a Catholic school. I got taken out of a state school and put into a Catholic school and um, uh, the rectors and everything like that uh, dealt with me and treated me a, a little bit differently because of it. Um, so that was actually a good move. Um, interesting. But um, Very interesting. So uh, were you in high school, were you, were you the cool guy in high school? Were you the, like the 4.0 genius getting everything right or pushing the te teachers, challenging the teachers? Who were you in high school? Uh, no, I was the annoying prick. I, I was the guy who nearly got expelled because, um, um, I, had a big argument. 
I, I, I had a big argument once with the teacher over the textbook um, and then demonstrated how the textbook was wrong and um, we shouldn't be uh, teaching this crap. And uh, Yeah. Somehow I see that. I don't know why. <laughs> so, uh, uh, yeah, I, I didn't have a good, uh, I didn't let it go very well. So they, they said, sit down, Craig. No, but it's actually wrong. And you uh, <laughs> just learn it. No. Uh, well, listen, thank you for uh, being transparent and being willing to talk about this. That was very helpful because I do know in the business environment, there's a lot of folks that are working with somebody that has it and they don't have an understanding of it. And sometimes parents have kids that have that and it's tough to mm. kind of understand where that is. And it's tough for the kid because the kid wishes parents knew, listen, man, I don't know what I have, but I'm a little bit different. Please be patient with me. This isn't how I made myself be like this. I was born like this. So well, that's, that's the problem. We, we have a educational system now that for the most part just tries to slot people in and, and do exams and it's not good i mean education isn't about training and exams it's about making people think and be part of society and understand and and kids now actually look at all these other courses like uh, music and um, and english and, and sit there and go but why do i need this it's not what I'm going to get into uni with. It's not where my grades are coming from. Well, because it's education. You don't want just to get a tick box. You want to learn to think. Yeah, I'm with you there. Speed round. I'm going to give you a name. Tell me the first word that comes to mind. I'll give you a name. Just tell me the first word that comes to mind. Uh, Gavin and Reeson. Um, very interesting guy. And um, uh, he got too much shit. Jeff Gersick. Yeah, well, anyway. Gregory Maxwell. <laughs> um, Trotsky. Trotsky, okay. Peter Wolf, <laughs> Peter Wolf on Blockstream. Oh, um, don't waste my time. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fair enough. Dan Kaminsky. Oh. Uh, uh, an idiot that um, has uh, had run-ins with me since 2000 or so um, that tries to pretend he doesn't and forgets that I've still got papers out there on DNS and things like that. But um, uh, I'm not the best person to point out when things are wrong. Um, and a lot of people get annoyed when I do, especially in conferences and things like that, like... Um, when you sit there and go, uh, actually, your mathematics is wrong, your, uh, this process is wrong, you haven't used the right statistics. Uh, and I do that to people in conferences when they're presenting things. And uh, I don't endear people. But I'm not actually meaning to be a complete asshole. It's just uh, uh, when I see things that I, I want to go into detail, it's for me. It's not actually to be a complete prick. It's just the way I am. Jack Dorsey. Uh, no, I'm sorry, you did not spend an hour in your sauna at 110 degrees. Stop bullshitting. <laughs> Fair enough. How finny? A shame that we don't put more money into research into certain medical problems. Vitalik Buterin. Uh, um, just admit it's your father. <laughs> wow. Okay. Peter Schiff. Uh, don't care. Max Kaiser. <laughs> really, find something better to shill. <laughs> uh, Magistrate Judge Bruce Reinhardt. Not going to make any comments about ongoing case stuff, whatever else. John McAfee. I didn't. You did say stuff about him earlier. Do you have anything to say about John McAfee? Get off the drugs. Ron Paul. Um, don't actually know him. I think got some interesting like ideas, but um, uh, but yeah, I. I think you'd I, like. Him. He's an interesting guy. Jamie Dimon. Um, part of the problem. <laughs> wow. Mark Zuckerberg. Um, there are solutions to digital cash. You don't need to make it yourself. <laughs> Just use Bitcoin. Michael Burry. Don't know enough. Don't know enough. David, David Solomon. 
Um, know who it is, but I, I don't really know enough. Okay. And last but not least, Satoshi Nakamoto. I shouldn't have abdicated. You know, I got to tell you, I said this to you earlier. The more I talked to you, I saw two different people. If Edward Norton and Charlie Sheen were to make a baby together, he would look like Craig Wright. He'd look like you. Ed Norton, I, Charlie Sheen. I don't even want to imagine that. I, I yeah. really don't want to see Charlie Sheen and Ed Norton well, making a baby. <laughs> I, I mean, it's, I mean, there's, there's no, I mean, I, Jimmy, um, who I work with, um, is gay and I've got lots of gay friends. So that's not the issue. I just, those two together just doesn't do it for me. I'm sorry. Maybe in a future movie coming soon, you know, it's, it's, yeah. who knows what's going to be happening, but the way, when you talk, you have angles. You look like Norton. There's angles. You talk, you look like Charlie Sheen. Uh, Craig Wright, what I can tell you is I appreciate you for being a guest on Value Team and taking all my questions. And you were very uh, classy about some of the topics I brought up. I know some of the topics were pretty directed and pointed, but you took them well. And we've had a good time thank to you. get here for the last hour and a half, hour and 45 minutes. Again, thank you for your time for being a guest on Value Team. You're welcome. Um, I must say, your um, um, sort of picture in the background um, interesting mix of people there. Yes, Not it is. Quite, I mean, I can pick out most of them. I mean, Lincoln's easy. Um, I mean, uh, Friedman, Einstein, Kennedy, etc. I'm not quite sure who the guy with all the medals is, uh, happens to be. I mean, he could be several people. Um, which dictator? That's the question. <laughs> he looks like several. <laughs> Shah of Iran, the former Shah of Iran. Ah. Reza, uh, he's the Shah of Iran. And then you got Martin Luther King. Then you got a hip hop artist. I'm sure you listen to a lot of his music, Tupac. Um, um, I, I've got children, um, so I don't have a choice. <laughs> <laughs> and then you got Senna over here. And I think what you'll appreciate is they're sitting in a bank vault and they're debating two books. Hmm. See if you recognize these two books. Uh, one has a little um, dragon. Um, that looks like a, um, a Bitcoin y type one. I'm not sure what the other book is. It could be, um, it could be, looks like Rothbard or something by the cover, um, but it's thick enough to be Rothbard. Um, and the color's right for Rothbard's book. Good, good, close. They're debating Communist Manifesto and Atlas Shrug, is what they're debating. Ah. Why um, Ayn Rand and Karl Marx had different philosophies, and obviously communist politicians, they're debating those two topics. Although, um, yeah, the Communist Manifesto is even thinner than that, by the way. Yeah, you're right. It is. I got to contact the painter and say, why'd you pay, add additional 80 pages to it? Exactly. Frank, thanks again. Thanks for being a guest. No problem. Is that Marcus Aurelius in the background? Or? Listen, honestly, like, how do you know that's Marcus Aurelius? It is Marcus Aurelius. Yes. Um, Aurelius and I, Aristotle. I, I, I try and be a little bit stoic. I, I really fail, but um, I would like to be a good stoic. I'm just, doesn't work. I, I keep trying. Um, and um, to go into the whole Aristotle bit, uh, you can't actually say someone is happy until the day they die because you never know what will happen tomorrow. So similarly, I'm going to say, I can't say that I'm not a stoic until the day I die. So until then, I'm going to keep trying. It's not an easy thing to do, that's for sure. Very hard. Especially in this world, yes. Especially in this world, no doubt about it. Craig, thank you. Thank you for your time. You're welcome. So I got to tell you, many of you asked me to do this interview, even though you don't like him. I posted something on Twitter saying, I just sat down with Craig Wright. And I can tell you, most people said, I cannot believe you sat down with him. He's a con artist. He's a scammer. He's a liar. There's no way he's Satoshi Nakamoto. And then the people that believe he is didn't post it on Twitter. They DM me and say, he said, he is. Here's why. Don't listen to everybody else. So what are your thoughts? Is he Satoshi Nakamoto, the founder of Bitcoin? Is it somebody else? What do you think about the argument with Adam Back or whether it's Finney? All of these names. I'm curious. Comment below on who you think is Satoshi Nakamoto. And if you enjoyed today's interview, I have two other ones I want you to watch. One of them is with John McAfee. I did this interview a couple of years ago in his house uh, uh, in Tennessee. And if you've not seen this interview, it's epic. In the middle of it, somebody knocks on the door. One of his guys pull, pulls out a gun. John had a gun the entire time while I did the interview. 
and it was a different kind of a conversation, but we did talk about Bitcoin. And the other interview is with Peter Schiff, who is not the biggest pro-Bitcoin. He's anti-Bitcoin. He's more pro-gold. And if you've not watched that one, click over here. And if you've not subscribed to the channel, please do so. Thanks for watching, everybody. Take care. Bye-bye.